Welcome, everybody. Um, so I'm Eric Clavens. I'm the chair of the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department here at the University of Washington. Um, and today at 3.30 is our 13th annual uh, lecture in the Dean W. Lytle Electrical and Computer Engineering Endowed Lecture Series. And today's speaker is Scott Aronson, and he'll be talking about quantum computational supremacy and its applications. Um, and since there's so much activity and interest on campus and in the Northwest around quantum information science, we thought it would be useful to add to the Lytle lecture event um, this panel discussion. So uh, I'd like to also welcome you to the very first ever Lytle panel uh, discussion, hopefully one, and uh, we'll do this every year from, from now on. Um, I wish that we could all be here in person, um, especially for this event, because it's one of the sort of biggest highlights of the of the year. Um, but as everybody has, we've had to adapt. Um, but you know, in a way, this format has its own benefits because we have people from all over the world attending who may not have been able to um, fly out even in, in normal times. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who's involved in organizing this event, especially the faculty host and chair of the Lytle Lectureship Committee, that's Mariam Fazel. She's the Morthy Family Endowed Professor and the Associate Chair for Research in our department. So thank you, Mariam, for all the work that you've put into this. Um, uh, let's see, I'd also like to thank the panel organizer for today, that's uh, Professor Kaime Fu. Um, she brought together all the speakers that you will um, be hearing from today. She's the Director of the Optical Spintronics and Sensing Lab, and she's an Associate Professor in um, ECE and in Physics here at UW. Um, and she's involved in UW strategy uh, for quantum in many different levels. Um, so she's, for example, this, the co-chair of the steering committee for the Quantum X initiative at UW, which facilitates and supports activities to accelerate quantum discoveries and technologies. Um, and Kaime will also be a speaker in today's panel. So you'll learn much more about her background and research um, in the discussion. Um, and finally, I'd like to introduce Arka Majumdar. So she, he is uh, um, an associate professor in um, the ECE department and also has a, a position in the Department of Physics. And he's going to be moderating today's panel discussion. Um, so Arka works on hybrid integrated nanophotonic platforms using emerging material systems. Um, he's exploring applications in ultra low power optical information science, imaging, and microscopy. Um, he's won several awards, including the Intel Career uh, Early Fac Faculty Award and the Sloan Fellowship, and most recently an NSF Career Award. And so uh, please join me in welcoming Arka, who is going to introduce and moderate our panel. Uh, thank you, Eric, and thank you, everyone, uh, for um, joining uh, this panel. We have four very exciting speakers from university uh, and also um, national lab and also from industry. Uh, just, just a reminder, if you have any questions for the panel, panel please uh, send it into the Q&A box. Uh, the chat is not for sending questions, so you will please send it to the uh, question and answer box uh, if you have any questions for the panelists. So our first speaker today is uh, Professor Kaime Fu uh, from University of Washington. Um, so Kaime, do you want to share your screen and you are muted. Yes, I'm sharing my screen right now. Thank you, Arka. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so it's great for me to kick this off before we hear um, from Brent from Pacific Northwest National Lab, Labs, um, David Bacon from INQ and Chris Esfore from Microsoft. So uh, my goal today is to uh, tell you a little bit about the research that's going on in the electrical and computer engineering department, including in my, my own lab, um, as well as the steps that the department is taking to grow in this area as part of an effort to grow quantum information across campus and also across the regions and give you um, some idea as well as how you can engage uh, in this area uh, in the future. So um, this is a, a 
a general talk. And so, of course, I, I want to start out with, with just what is quantum information uh, science and technology? Uh, in the very briefest explanation in QIST, we replace the digital bit with which is zero or one with the quantum bit, which is this vector superposition of zero and one where alpha and beta can be complex. So for people that are, are joining us after a break from undergraduate, this may bring back fond memories. Um, we can uh, visualize, or at least I visualize this, this quantum bit uh, as being a point on the surface of a sphere where theta is telling us the, the relative amplitude of how much zero and one we have, and phi is telling us um, the, the phase information be between these two coefficients. So uh, now, instead of just taking two specific values, our qubit actually can take on a value over this entire uh, surface. And this fundamentally different computational paradigm has been an intellectually rich curiosity since the 1980s. So why the excitement now? Um, I think everyone talking today was excited long before the 19, not, not, not long before the 1980s, but long before now. Um, but, but there's a certain amount of excitement that's happening right now in 2020. Um, and a few things that happened were first that uh, this was really critical that quantum error correction and fault tolerant computational schemes were developed, which enable practical implementation. Uh, at the very beginning, it was pretty clear to a lot of physicists, at least, that computation was just going to be doomed. A scalable computation was going to be doomed by errors, and the theorists in this case came to the rescue. But the numbers that they gave the experimentalists to achieve them were ridiculously daunting. Luckily, the theorists brought those numbers down while the experimentalists were slowly working to make their devices behave um, a little bit better. And so the second thing that happened were that qubits um, capable of reaching this fault tolerant threshold could be fabricated, at least in the onesies, twosies, fusies regime. Um, and these, these systems include superconducting qubits, trapped ions, um, and silicon-based quantum dots. And then, based on these, there's been a massive expansion of investment uh, by government and industry, which helps us accelerate the, the advancing technology. So what does quantum information in, help us enable? Um, one is quantum computing, and I'm not going to say much about those right now, because I think we're going to learn so much more uh, from the Lido lecture. Uh, this this evening. Um, one is quantum communication, whereby the laws of physics, you can securely uh, uh, give to people a, a, a key, a cryptography key in which they could communicate. And this is fundamentally secure by the laws of physics. Another is quantum simulation, um, in which you can trap uh, atoms or, or mimic lattice type systems, just like the solids that that exist all around us, but then actually control the interactions and simulate what the properties of, of a material might be. And then the fourth one is um, quantum sensing and metrology, where, as, where you can use these uh, qubits as very, very sensitive uh, sensors and, and clocks. And we have some people working in many of these different areas. Uh, I have a, a project in quantum sensing. Moli, Arka Majumdar, and Carl Boringer um, are developing a, a platform for controlling the massive number of atoms that you would need in these in these quantum simulations. Um, but the the largest kind of heaviest region area of research right now in the electrical computer engineering is in quantum quantum networks. And you kind of see that I kind of smacked that over computing and communication in these areas. Um, so what are the applications for a quantum network? One uh, is long distance communication. And then the other, uh, which is the more challenging longer term vision is distributed quantum computing, where you can see that you need a network to uh, connect smaller uh, modular elements um, or comp computational modules. Okay, so that's kind of a, a flash overview um, of the area, specifically um, in the area of this quantum networks and my research, uh, I focus on what actually is going to be 
a good node for a quantum network. So this is a, a circuit diagram or a quantum circuit diagram that it turns out can be um, uh, realized by making one of these qubit graph networks. And the question that, that, I, that I look at physically, because I'm an experimentalist, is, is this node. And one may think, well, you should make the node an atom or, or an ion, because that's the quintessential quantum object, and it has a long uh, quantum memory time. And there are uh, companies, including uh, Dave Vagan's company, which is looking at using ions. But I kind of do the opposite, where you can have a perfect crystal that has atoms in specific spots and then just take out an atom or take out a couple of atoms. Uh, the crystal that I look at is diamond and the particular uh, defect is the nitrogen vacancy center. And in this case, one of the carbon um, atoms is a nitrogen and one of them is just an empty, an empty spot. And you can look at the energy level structure of this defect and realize the elements that you need for one of these qubits in this network. Um, in this case, we have our zero and one states where we can access that whole surface I told you about for the qubit by using radio frequency waves. And we also have transitions that are optical to an excited state that allows us to make these links in this quantum network. Of course, the situation is much more complicated. This is not the energy level structure of the NV center. It looks something more like this after 20 years of material scientists and spectroscopists um, digging around and looking for all the possible energy levels and all the processes that can be happening. Um, and I think uh, what, what you can take away is that we can take something like this, figure what this is like, what this looks like for a defect, and then we can create the simpler system over here to actually do a quantum information protocol. Okay, um, so these, these introductions are supposed to be about 12 minutes long and, and then you have a few minutes of questions and then we'll have a discussion at the end. So I am going a little slow. So I'm going to go a little faster here. What I'll say is that we start with that defect and in my group, uh, we, we have to be able to get that photon out. So I work a lot on making integrated devices which allow us to create our defect and then shuttle the light that gets emitted on the chip as we seek to start to connect different defects. And this type of photonic circuit that you see on the right, I would like to highlight um, was made at the Washington Nanofabrication Facility uh, here, here on campus. Um, in this case, uh, you have a, a wave guiding layer, a diamond with these quantum defects. And in this particular study, these are actually electrodes that are deposited on the sample to control the frequency of the light that's being emitted by the defects. Okay, the challenges for creating networks, computers is quite challenging. Um, they're gonna require engineering solutions, defect creation, engineering the levels, coupling different defects, robustness to the defects being at different frequencies. And these are gonna require something that's called quantum frequency conversion, changing one color photon into another color photon. Um, all while mitigating against loss and, and device failure. And this example in this particular case is a project that Ark and I are working on where you can start with a defect and try to efficiently collect uh, the light that it's emitting in the visible, transmit it to telecom and efficiently get it to an optical fiber where it can then be used for communication. This is a small problem in this scale. There's doesn't even touch upon full systems architectures and and the engineering challenges um, in quantum information science and technology. So with that, um, I'm excited to, to let people here know that UW is expanding um, with a cluster hire in the College of Engineering, where we uh, expect to be able to have expertise all the way from materials and devices where we are, we are well represented now up to software and algorithms. And if you're interested, um, and learning more about this, you can go to the websites that I have here to learn more about the searches. And we're also interested in training um, the next generation of, of quantum scientists 
and, and engineers. And so we are launching uh, an NSF, National Science Foundation, National Research Traineeship Program that will, um, that PhD and master's graduate students um, can get an option in quantum information science and technology and work with our industrial partners to get hands-on research in this area for the expanding industry. This is um, all part of a larger University of Washington and regional initiative um, I just want to point out uh, Quantum X, with, with which Eric Clavens talked about um, briefly. This is where all the researchers in quantum get together and advertise news and events. And you can come here and, and learn what's going on and come into a seminar such like as this, which is advertised um, on the website. And also the Northwest Quantum Nets, which is a similar regional effort that that hosts seminars and workshops in the area and was founded by Microsoft PNNL and the University of Washington. So, um, so with that, uh, that's uh, the end of, of my talk and I'm happy to answer questions if there's time for it before the next speaker. Uh, thanks, Kaime. So we now have questions, uh, time for three minutes for any specific questions to Kaime. And just to remind everyone that we will have like a longer around 20 minutes Q&A session after all the talks are done um, together. Um, so I don't see any Q&A. Uh, one thing that kind of if you can mention that what is the like the biggest uh, kind of number of qubits in Diamond Envy centers and where is that going on? If you can tell a little bit uh, the, uh, us about that. Yeah, so um, the biggest NV system is one nitrogen vacancy defect, which is actually coupled uh, to 10 nuclear spins. And so this is like one of those little modules that you can imagine where you have an electron spin, which is one qubit, and I think it's nine or 10 nuclear spins, which are additional qubits. Now the challenge with this is that's just one defect. And the big challenge is connecting one of these modules to another module. So they've done that with just, or, or the, the community has done that with just you know, two NV centers but that's not also taking into account the nuclear spin environment. So that's kind of a technical answer, but 10, but going from 10 to more than 10 is nonlinear process. There's another question uh, from Natalie. Uh, does, do silicon-based quantum dots require the extremely cold temperatures like the superconducting qubits? Right now, yes. They, they do. Um, they, I think there was a recent result where they could do some things at one Kelvin instead of um, 100 millikelvin, but one Kelvin still pretty cold and the performance was not as good as at the lower temperatures. Okay, um, so I think we are, uh, we, uh, there's another question from uh, Mo. Um, could you comment on Pacific Northwest strength in QISD as compared with other regional centers, including Boston, Bay Area, Southern California? So, <laughs> um, so we have several companies here, which I think makes the Pacific Northwest quite strong. Um, what we we've heard, I would say, the the Boston, the Boston area, but also the the northern. Northern California area um, as well also has strength. So I, I think it's a point where the Pacific Northwest may be slightly behind, but given, but we're one of those big centers and given um, the companies that are here and our expansion for growth, I think we have the ability to become the number one in, in the country, but we're not there yet. Okay. Uh, thanks, Kaime. Um, so I think we will go into the next speaker, but if you have any other question, please uh, feel free to type uh, type in. We will have time uh, at the end of all the all the talks to go over all the questions again. Um, so we are, our uh, next speaker is Bryn uh, Van Devender from Pacific Northwest National Lab. So Bryn, you are muted and Apologies, I have to unmute and then share. I lose my mute button. Uh, where do we go? Right there. How's that? Do you see my slides? Yes. All right. So uh, Professor Fu talked about a, a, a category of qubit devices called 
uh, generally solid state qubits, I'll talk about a different candidate technology for qubits called uh, superconducting qubits. And in particular, I'll, I'll talk about devices, I'll talk about a basic metric of their performance called the coherence time, uh, and then some work that I do studying how these devices respond to natural radiation in the environment and, and what that has to do, what were the implications for their design and their eventual use. So a superconducting qubit device, there are a few flavors uh, depending on what is quantized in the circuit and how you read it out. So you can see charge flux in phase qubits across the top. They all have in common though, one thing is that they have at least one Josephson junction. So a Josephson junction is just this structure here of superconductor insulator superconductor sandwich, um, such that in a circuit, in a qubit circuit, you can set up like this. You have the Josephson junction itself. It has an inherent inductance and capacitance. And then you add some other inductors and capacitors to make the qubit behave like you want. If you ever studied electronics, you will recognize this circuit as an oscillator. Uh, that, that is indeed what it is, but it's important that it's not just a normal oscillator that you would get if you used classical inductors and capacitors. If you did that, you would get a harmonic oscillator where the energy levels are spaced equally such that you can't usefully address transitions between them, that they're all the same. It's very important that this Josephson junction is nonlinear, the, in, the inductance is nonlinear, such that the energy levels are spaced unequally. We call this an anharmonic oscillator. You can address the transitions individually. And in particular, you can address transitions between the ground state and the first excited state and use those as the states of your qubit, the zero and one. Couple of references. The, the frequency of that transition is, is in the microwave, it's a few gigahertz. And the energy corresponding to that transition is only on order of like 10 micro electron volts. So it's very small. So you have to be very cold and you have to really protect these from interactions with the environment that will force those transitions that you didn't intend. We saw a few minutes ago that you can represent this. All qubits are like this. You, you can represent their state on what's called the block sphere, um, where the, the zero state is the North Pole, the one state is the South Pole, and any other state, generally an admixture of those two, is some other point on the sphere represented by this orange vector. Operations on a qubit are represented by some operator which has the axis that you rotate that vector around and the angle by which you rotate it. So for instance, an X pi pulse rotates you, applied to the zero, will rotate you by pi 180 degrees around the X axis and turn you into a one state. You can do half of that, pi over two about the x-axis and get into this mixed state of zero and one. And, and therein lies part of the magic of, of quantum computing is that you can be in these mixed states. One of the most basic metrics of a qubit, any qubit, is what we call its coherence time. Uh, and you can measure that, you, you can quantify that by, by putting a qubit into its one state and seeing what is the probability that it's still there with it, that it has not relaxed back to its zero state after some time t. You do that by applying an X pi pulse to the ground state and then measuring it sometime tau later to see if it's still there and you just map out the probability and characterize the time. In this example, it's 85 microseconds. Now, uh, superconducting qubits have been following a Moore's law in coherence time or had been at least for, uh, you know, since the, the turn of the century, they were only a nanosecond back in the early 2000s now up to hundreds of microseconds. The current world record is 300 microseconds. And I would say it's pretty clear that we've fallen off this old Moore's law. We're now at best on a, 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 a shallower Moore's law. But still, all of these, even this world record, have followed from improvements in the design of devices. You can design them to be impervious to noise from their environment, and also in the materials you use to construct them. So more pure materials can result in longer coherence times. That addresses lots of sources of decoherence, which you can see on this top right diagram. The one I think the most about, though, is what we call quasi-particle poisoning. So quasi-particle poisoning just refers to the fact that there are, in a superconductor, electricity is carried without uh, electrical resistance because the electrons at low temperature will pair up and flow without resistance. Quasi-particles, you can it's a technical term. It's really just a free electron, two free electrons from when you break one of those Cooper pairs. Those cause troubles because they don't flow without resistance. They're dissipative. They can exchange energy. 
in such a way that you can flip the state of a qubit device if they exist. And also they, they fluctuate in their number during a measurement. And so you get a kind of noise we call shot noise. To, 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 to set the scale of how bad the problem is, we should talk about how many you think should be there. Uh, and this is just a straightforward thermodynamics calculation using some superconductor theory. The, the thermal density, this is uh, quasi particles or free electrons per cubic micron is just the density of states, capital N. There's a, a delta, this is what we call the superconducting gap. It's like the binding energy for electrons to make one of these Cooper pairs and the temperature T. So the superconducting gap is 180 microelectron volts in, in, uh, excuse me, in aluminum, which is a typical superconductor. And KT uh, is 1.7 microelectron volts at 20 millikelvin, which is a typical temperature at which you run superconducting devices. And you'll note that this thermal density is therefore suppressed by an exponential factor like e to the minus 100. Plugging in the numbers, you expect only one times 10 to the minus 40 free electrons per cubic micron at device temperature. There are way more than that. In real devices, it's actually a general property of superconductors. You see tenths, or excuse me, hundredths to hundreds per cubic micron, not 10 to the minus 40, which is effectively none at all. To get this density purely by thermal origin, you would have to be at 165 millikelvin, which is much, much hotter than 20 millikelvin. And so we call this quasi-particle poisoning. There are way more broken Cooper pairs than you think there should be based on the BCS theory. It, it's really a general property of superconductors. It doesn't matter the materials, who's doing the experiment. Nobody really thinks this, this BCS theory is incorrect though. And so we need some new hypothesis that can explain this universal excess. There are not many things that are that universal and not already ruled out, uh, but natural radiation in the environment is one of those things. And so we actually did an experiment recently to test that. A little aside, I'm a nuclear physicist, so this is very ordinary stuff for me. I think a lot of people though are surprised to realize just how much natural radiation there is in the environment. You can take a standard detector, this is a piece of three inch by three inch sodium iodide, and just measure the, the radiation environment in your laboratory and you will find about 10 counts per second, 10 radiation events per second from potassium, thorium, and uranium that just exist in normal materials and also cosmic rays. And so this is a spectrum of that radiation. Uh, you can see classic, uh, classic for people in nuclear physics spectra of potassium, uranium, thorium, and cosmic rays, which go out to much higher energies. And so what we think is going on is all those different radiations are interacting somewhere in the device. So this is like a side view of a qubit. Uh, this is extremely not to scale, by the way, the silicon basically dominates the, the thickness. Um, but these radiations can interact anywhere in the device, not necessarily directly in the superconductor, deposit energy. That energy can flow through the device through a number of processes, phonons, photons. Eventually they get into the superconductor where they still have more than 180 microelectron volts so they can break one of these Cooper pairs. We tested that by, by operating qubit devices. So here is a real qubit device. It, it's the tiny little silicon chip in there blown up on the right. That's a photograph of a qubit device uh, with false color. There's a, there's a blue qubit on the left and an orange qubit on the right that will color code some data I'll show you uh, in the next few slides. And we took a piece of copper and made it radioactive in the research reactor at MIT and put it right on top of the qubit. And that was nice because that we, we made it radioactive such that it has a half-life of just 12.7 hours. That was long enough for us to do some experience, put it together, cool down our refrigerator, which takes like 24 hours, but then still have several days of activity left so we could watch this source decay away to nothing and see what it did to the qubits. What it did was it, 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 it basically wrecked their coherence time. And so I'm plotting here on the top, not the coherence time, but what we call the relaxation rate. It's just one over the coherence time. So low relaxation rate is larger coherence time. And you can see over the course of hours, we did the experiment continuously for two weeks. You see this uh, relaxation rate going down and coming back to normal as the estimated power from radiation into the device decays away to nothing. They're not shaped exactly like each other because there's a square root relation between the power on the bottom and the uh, relaxation rate on the top. Uh, formally, we, we have a model. So what we call the polarization, that this is the probability that you stay in the one state after some time t, is this exponential function. 
the relaxation rate gamma has, you know, all those other sources of decoherence I alluded to, plus the the, the source from quasi particles. And the, the quasi particle part of that is just goes like the square root of power, the frequency of the qubit, and then some unknown factor A, which absorbs some fundamental constants and, and basically our ignorance of how well radiation makes quasi particles in a device. It's, it's basically the thing we're trying to determine in the experiment. Uh, putting it all together, this is the same data as above, but now I'm showing you that relaxation rate versus the power into the device. So the power was going down through the experiments. You can kind of think of time as going right to left in this. And we can use this early time, high power region of our data when, when the, the total radiation is dominated by the radiation from the source to get a value for that parameter and then extrapolate it and say, okay, well, what would be the coherence time if you could remove all the other sources of decoherence, what is, what is the limit that, that radiation in the environment would set? And we find that at least for qubits of the type we measured, you're gonna be limited to just a few microseconds. That's not anywhere near long enough for the general purpose quantum computing you would like to do. So you're gonna to have to deal with this. Um, that was a very high level description of the experiment. There are many more details in, in a paper we recently published here. And I'll just close by, by, by saying, you know, what are the implications of this? So, so one of the, the, the first implication is that we, you know, we have definitely discovered a, a connection between radiation, quasi particle and qubit performance. Uh, it's actually a little bit more of a general solution than that. The quasi particle poisoning is generically a problem of superconductor. Uh, I think we can say that natural radiation from the environment is at least part of the cause. I'm actually comfortable with a stronger statement that it is at least most of the cause. Um, and we did two experiments. I only talked about the one where we elevated the radiation. We also did an experiment where we shielded and reduced the radiation and showed that the times went up. Now, the world record is 300 microseconds. And I told you that radiation limits you to only three milliseconds. So there's a gap there. And, and so the other result of our finding, and we didn't know this going in, is that you know, radiation quasi-particle poisoning is not the leading cause of decoherence right now. Something else is the leading cause. But if we want to stay on Moore's law, even that relaxed Moore's law that, that my earlier plot implied, you know, we should be working on the problem after next already. And we are in fact doing that now. And so now that we know this is a problem, we can do more experiments to learn the microscopic details, which then inform designs of qubits that are maybe impervious to these, uh, these effects. Uh, and also I, I alluded to the fact that I'm a nuclear physicist. We can make devices that are less impervious or uh, you know, less sensitive to quasi-particles for better QIS, qubit devices. But for me, thinking about things like detecting dark matter and neutrinos, we can also make much more sensitive radiations where we can use those quasi-particles as like the information carriers in our detector technologies. That's all, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Brent. There's already uh, one question. So I think first let's do a slide 13. It's millisecond or microsecond. I think it is millisecond. I think there's maybe... Uh -oh. So slide 13, I think it's... Oops, come on. Yeah, so it's a, I think it's a 3.13 millisecond. Um, yeah. yeah, so, so, so the, 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 the limit re is three, it's about three to four milliseconds. And, and I get that by extrapolating, see the dashed lines. It's where they would intersect. I'm sorry, I forgot to say this. We estimated the natural dose of radiation in the devices and where these two points intersect, which would be off the bottom of the slide. Uh, that's what gives you that uh, about three milliseconds. Okay. And also in slide four, um, I think there is a question about uh, is X by the same as Wi-Fi? Uh, yeah, you could do a Y pi pulse and turn a zero into one also. That, that would give you the same result. Okay. Uh, and, and while we're at that level of detail, I realized as I was showing the slide that that plus sign maybe should be a minus sign. I can't remember what you get when you actually apply the right X pi over two operator to zero. So don't copy this on your homework until you do. <laughs> uh, I, I want, want, so this, as you're saying, is more, is for the transmont qubit, I believe, but there is like right. you know, other qubits as well. And also like, I mean, if you think of a topological qubit, they're also using superconducting system. So is this kind of a generic statement for any other system or is primary to transmont qubit? So, so I believe it is generally true 
that, that radiation will put energy into your device and break Cooper pairs if it couples into the superconductor. So far, uh, I, so I'm actually quite new to the qubit world. I've only thought deeply about the transmon qubits I've worked with. I believe it's generally true for the other types of qubits, but maybe they're somehow less sensitive to the quasi particles. And so, you know, one of the informed design choices you can make now that you understand this is, is you know, thinking about what's the geometry of your qubit that would be less sensitive. Okay, um, thank you, Brent. Again, uh, you can put uh, questions in Q&A. Uh, we are going to go to the third speaker, uh, uh, David Bacon from IonQ, who previously worked with superconducting system <laughs> in Google. Uh, so, David, go ahead. Hi, can everyone see my shared screen here? Let me, uh, yes. I, have it on, I have it on a weird monitor, so give me just a second to, you guys still see it now? No, now we see the. <laughs> ah, okay, let me, let me, let me just keep it over here then. Here we yeah. go. I can, I can, I can adjust. So if I look a little bit to the left, you guys will know why. So I'm Dave Bacon. Uh, I'm a software engineer, uh, actually. So a little bit different than the other people on here. I was previously uh, at Google and moved to IonQ. In fact, uh, Kaime asked me while I was in the middle, middle of moving. So we had to be careful about what my affiliation was for a little bit, which is pretty funny. Um, so I'm going to talk about the quantum race. And it's supposed to be sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of the, should, it should invoke in you exactly what I want it to, which is that it's like the space race, right? Uh, and here's the famous quote by JFK where he said, you know, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things not because they're easy, because they're hard, right? I love this quote. My favorite thing about this quote though is not what probably everybody else does, is like, what are those other things, right? And you have to go read the speech to see why it makes sense. He puts in a, a joke about uh, Texas uh, A&M, I think also in there, which when you read it, you're kind of like, that's a little out of place. Um, but, you know, the quantum world is in, engaged in a similar, very challenging process. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's in some ways, uh, you know, more challenging in some ways than going to the moon, which sounds crazy, but it's because we're really trying to engineer effectively a new phase of matter. So this is sort of the way I think about it is, you know, we have these different phases of matter, which is a physicist way of saying, you know, there are these, you know, a, a solid is different from a, a liquid, which is different from a gas, right? And what's happening there is there's different robust properties of the system that are emerging out of, of these systems at a large scale with a large number, you know, if we have 10 to the 23 atoms in, in a system, that's a huge number of things, but somehow these robust properties emerge, right? And what the quantum computing world is trying to do is they're trying to do a similar thing. We're trying to build a computer. So we're trying to build this phase of matter that can do quantum computation. And that should emerge by, uh, you know, some in some globally sort of robust property. Um, and that's that's a really challenging thing, right? To, to sort of engineer or get to a, a new state of, of, of matter. And, and that there's a sort of, you know, in the early days and the stuff I, I worked on a, a long time ago, it was about sort of what is this thing, right? Like, and, and why does it exist? And one of the great discoveries uh, in the early nine and the mid nineties was that you could do uh, this thing called quantum error correction uh, and that it would allow you to, to build this, that there really is some, some way to sort of take a bunch of noisy components and build this robust phase of matter. So what is this magic? Here's a picture of the magic. I cribbed this from Craig Gidney, who is a, a software engineer at, at Google, an incredible guy. We call him Craig the compiler. Uh, this is a picture of uh, in space and time. So sort of going upwards is time and, and sort of the other two directions are, are, are space. And this is a picture of, of doing a quantum computation uh, using this thing called the surface code, which is an error correcting code uh, and doing this in what people call a fault tolerant manner. So this is a pretty complex construction that ends up doing some basic manipulation on your computer. So think about, a, a, you know, at the lowest level, your computer is executing a bunch of instructions. This is like one of those instructions. Uh, and this is actually, you know, simplifying a lot of things. These are not, uh, you know, like individual qubits here. You have to know sort of what's going on in this picture, but it's a very complex beast that we're trying to build out of this thing. Um, and so why would you do this, right? Like, why would you, why, first of all, we, you know, we haven't really talked about why we're trying to, why people are excited about this. We can imagine Kennedy asking, actually, that he wants to build a quantum computer. And I won't try to do a JFK accent, though. Uh, I once did get mistaken. Somebody thought I was a Kennedy, which I thought was one of the funniest things I'd ever happened in my life, at a bar, of course. Um, so why would we do this? Well, there's pay dirt at the end of this experience, right? Quantum computers manipulate quantum information. They speak quantum. And because those computers can speak quantum, 
they allow us to, to simulate quantum systems, right? And this is really the killer app that a lot of people focus on as the, one of the big payoffs for quantum computing. Um, and the, the number of places where it can apply these simulations is vast. And what happens is we know that in the classical world, as we try to build larger and larger simulations of these quantum systems, our algorithms just don't keep up, right? And you know, it, it could be that there's some smart algorithms, but this has been a huge issue for many, many years and no one really has made progress on that. So there's a lot of uh, belief that, that that the real way, the only real way you can simulate these larger quantum systems is to actually use a quantum computer. So this is the pay dirt that a lot of companies are excited about in the long term. There's other reasons to believe it because there's a lot of weird quantum algorithms that exist. And so, uh, you know, this has set off a race. Uh, and as, as kind of said earlier, right, like it's, it's only recently that, you know, this has started to come to the place where we're, or the point where we can start to really think about trying to scale these things up. Right. Uh, I've been working. I, I realized the other day the calculation. I first did. Uh, I first worked in quantum computing in 1996 as a as a like a summer project. So I, if I calculated, I'm almost at half my life spent working on this, which both makes me old and a little bit scared <laughs> for how much of my life I've been working on this. Uh, but what's happened in the, the last few years and the excitement uh, and sort of the reason I actually left quantum computing and came back was that we're now at the point where we can really think about building you know, that sort of crazy contraption that, that Craig had on the previous slide. And that's because our qubits are better and we're at the point where we're, we're moving to a place where there's a lot more engineering going on to build these systems out. So Seattle, as was asked sort of what's going on in Seattle, there are a ton of different players. Here are some of the ones I've listed here. Uh, here's the quintessential tourist photo from Seattle uh, up on uh, Cary Park. Uh, and, uh, you know, Google has had a presence here. I'm actually was leading the quantum software team at Google. Uh, and I recently switched. So there's a, a new one there, which is INQ. Uh, and INQ will be opening an office uh, in Seattle once offices become a thing again. <laughs> uh, and so I and INQ is a company that builds quantum computers based on trapping ions. So here's a picture of an ion trap. You see a bunch of electrodes going down to this little tiny region. And what happens is you can, you can trap individual ions or chains of ions into these systems. So the electrons that, sorry, the electrodes create a, a field. So you sort of have, you know, a well that these things sit in. You actually, you actually kind of spin the well around to keep things in there. And you get this chain of very nice uh, ions that are, that are trapped. And then you can do quantum computations by sending in laser pulses to each of those ions. And so individual laser pulses, each ion's a qubit. You can make those rotations that we're talking about earlier right, and do each of those. And then you can actually get them to couple because these things form a crystal. And if you have a crystal, these, the ions are repelling each other, but they're kind of pushed together, right? So they're like this crystal thing. If you poke one of them, right, what's gonna happen? Well, the other ones are in this crystal, they'll sort of like, you know, wiggle as well. And so by properly, you know, being smart about it and shooting lasers at say two ions at the same time, you can do a, you can do a quantum computation between those two ions. So you can couple these ions together. So INQ has traps that are on actually on Amazon's uh, cloud service that are uh, 11 qubits right now. And we're currently working on a really cool 32 qubit uh, system, uh, which I hope will you know, uh, amaze the world. So this is a, it's a, a, new, a, a new place, new thing for, 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 for Seattle in that, that uh, up until a few years ago, there weren't, was an ion trapping quantum computing company here, but UW has like one of the craziest things, right? Like UW literally has a Nobel Prize winner uh, or had, right? Who, who, you know, was one of the sort of creators and founders of ion trap quantum computing. Uh, and Boris Linov, who was mentioned early at UW has been doing uh, trapped ion computing here for a while. So here's, here's, uh, here's Professor Clement saying new, you know, I did this like way before, before any of you did. And uh, these are the absolute best chops of any professor ever, right? So. Okay, so then the sort of question that everybody asks when, I, when we talk about these things is who's going to win the race, right? And I, I, my answer to this is always like, I have no idea, right? Like, I really don't. And I, I just made a partial list of all the things you might think through as you're trying to think about a quantum computer and scaling it up, right? So it's an immensely complex question in sort of architectures and technologies. And uh, superconducting uh, circuits, which I previously worked on, have a lot of advantages. They have some disadvantages as well. And we're at this point where, where I think the next few years is going to be sort of fascinating uh, to see sort of who can scale to the next scale uh, of, of building these systems. Um, you know, how do we figure this out? Part of me is I'm an engineer and more connected some ways to the hardware these days, which is we really need to build these systems and see how they perform and scale them up, right? So put it in the blender and see if it works. Um, but I'm, I'll tell you sort of the reason I switched over to IONS, because I think it's an interesting one to sort of give you some perspective about this. 
Uh, many years ago, I would go look for faculty jobs and it was brutal. Like nobody knew about quantum computing. It was very, people were very skeptical of it. So there were these evil faculty that you would talk to and you'd be like, oh, there's this quantum computing thing and it's really great. And you would realize that, that this idea of quantum error correction, which is a foundational thing without error correction, there really is no scalable model of quantum computation. It wasn't something like that it, that it spread into the, you know, into everybody's knowledge of the world. And so in quantum computing, what would happen is that like, we would always have this thing where we'd have these conversations, people would raise objections, but they wouldn't know what error correction was. So quantum error correction for people in quantum computing is a shield. It's like, you need to understand it, right? Like to, uh, uh, you know, to be like, oh, it, you know, like if you don't understand that, then you don't quite understand what I've even talking about. So, so it was always used psychologically as sort of a, as a, as a weapon in some ways. Now, uh, on the other hand, I think it causes a, a, another sort of problem, which is that we think about error correction as the like, just get there and then boom, everything happens. And I think that's also uh, just a myth because uh, that's not really how almost all technologies evolve. Um, and so in many ways, what I think is the proper way to think about this is, is, is the, you know, the real question between the different implementations and approaches people taking are, is it going to be that you have a system that's noisy and you build it up and you build it larger, larger, and eventually get to this point where you can build a very large one. And then all of a sudden, boom, you have a really good robust qubit in this like fault tolerance structure? Is it gonna be a phase transition in time, right? Is all of a sudden that's gonna happen? And there are some technologies where that's sort of the way they're approaching it, right? Like that really they'll get there and then it'll all just sudden, sudden happen. There's another approach which just says, this is gonna be a gradual process, right? We're going to do a little bit of error correction and then a little bit more. And as we understand our system, maybe we can figure out error correcting tricks that, that nobody thought of because we have a deep understanding of our own system. So, so why that's sort of one of the reasons why I'm switching over and working on these new ion trap quantum computers. They have disadvantages, they're slower, but they have some really crazy advantages when thinking about trying to do this gradualism approach. In particular, these ions that are all sitting in this trap, if you jiggle this one over here and jiggle this one over here properly, you can couple them. It doesn't matter that they're you know, on op, you know, opposite ends of the trap. When you lay things out in say a superconducting uh, circuit, a quantum computer, your qubits only talk to your neighbors, right? And this causes problems. If I need to do you know, something here, you know, talk, have this qubit interact with this one over here, I have to basically swap them until they get close to each other and, and then do the interaction. Whereas in ion traps, that's not true. So very recently uh, at Duke, uh, Chris Munro, who is one of the co-founders along with Ken Brown, uh, their groups demonstrated a fault tolerant oper operation using 13 qubits in a trap. So they sort of made this first step. Now there's, it's, it's a very first step, it's a baby step, right? It's not doing the full thing that, it's not Craig Gibney's picture, right? But it's, it's the beginning of this step and I'm really excited to be, be working on ions because I'm, I'm sort of, I, I truly believe that we might be able to do amazing air correction things in the short term to sort of make this gradual thing and not necessarily rely on sort of the magic time when things happen. Okay, so that's sort of that's sort of the the state of the state of the, the world uh, for my perspective. Uh, you know, these 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 highly connected traps are going to be a fascinating architecture. There's a whole story I can tell you about the next step, which is we want to scale these up. Uh, and when you want to scale them up, what you're going to do is take these traps and build a modular architecture. So imagine you have these traps. They have to have little regions to move ions around because you need to like say shuttle some over to do some measurements on them and shuttle them back. So. So there's an approach where you build everything with shuttling things around on a big trip. But the approach that IonCube is taking is, is different. It's this modular architecture where you have that type of small thing for say, you know, 64 qubits or 128 qubits in sort of the smaller quantum computer. But then you hook them up sort of more like Jaime uh, had a picture of with these networks, right? And it turns out that if you can sort of get the quantum information into photons and then interfere them, you can create entanglement between the traps. And then you can use this trick called teleportation, great name, but it's, bless Monday what it actually does right uh, to actually you know do transport quantum information between these traps so there's sort of this idea of like you want to get to the point where you can build these little tiny modules that you can easily manufacture they're small and work and then scale it out in this modular direction and that's the approach that INQ is taking for the long-term process which is different than the superconducting circuits where you think you know there are actually similar approaches but a lot of more of it is like scale this thing big build a gigantic dilution refrigerator and you know, really focus on, on, on scaling that direction. We're doing the other thing where you want everything small and then manufacture a ton of them and connect them up. Okay, so that's, that's mostly what I always talk about. Uh, IONS are a fascinating platform. I think the, the race uh, right now is engaged in the air correcting race. That's sort of the stage we're at and that will be followed by the scaling race. Uh, and so I'm pretty excited to see who wins the air correcting race. 
Uh, and then, you know, who knows, it could be that the scaling race gets won by something else, right? Like, I, I think we're, we're at a pretty exciting time for, for, uh, for the field of quantum computing. Okay. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, so I think we have time only for one question and the other question we can take in the final panel. So we'll start with the first one. Um, so is there a problem that is provably uncomputable on non-quantum computers that is computable on a quantum computer? And I think uh, here we are, they're asking is not about the speed benefit. It just yeah. cannot be done. The answer is that, that, that nobody, right now it is not thought that that is true. Um, in fact, it, it, you have to really tweak the model of quantum computation to do that. So computable and uncomputable uh, is not something that quantum computers really separate right now. Um, there, there are some weird versions of that that I could I could talk about, but that's not not really probably what's what's asking here. But um, you know, the, the real reason that's true is that you can simulate a quantum computer. Uh, it just takes you a long time, right? It doesn't change. You know, it, we know that we can simulate it with just using a polynomial amount of space, but a but a but maybe an exponential amount of time, right? And so it's it, that separation is not in terms of computable versus uncomputable, but just in terms of complexity. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I think we'll go to the fourth speaker and there's another question that we can take uh, in the final um, Q&A session. So our final speaker of um, today's panel is uh, Krista Zvore from uh, Microsoft. So Krista. Great. Your... Thank you. Let me share my screen one moment. Find the right thing. Let's see if this works. All right, can everyone see this? Yes. Okay, great. Well, good, uh, I guess almost good afternoon. Um, thanks for inviting me to this panel today. I'm excited to be here. I'm the general manager of quantum systems and software at Microsoft. And uh, I think actually the, the presentations we've had this, this morning thus far have gone in a very good order. I'm actually gonna now target further up the stack and talk about the types of problems we can solve with a quantum computer if we're able to build one that's fault tolerant. And so we've just gone through different types of qubit systems and ways to build a quantum computer. And so now it nicely lands to the top of the stack to algorithms and uh, software. So First, you know, when we think about quantum computing, what we're really trying to do is redefine in many ways what computing is. And this includes what we'll be able to compute. It includes what does it mean to compute? We have a whole nother instruction set at our fingertips that I think uh, you've just seen with the other talks. Um, and, and with that, we also have to redefine how you program this, uh, what the software stack looks like, what's the hardware, how does that work? How do you control it? How do you read out? What does it mean to have input output, right? So we're really redefining so many aspects of computing. And then we wanna bring it together with classical computing. So one important thing to remember is a quantum computer isn't standalone, right? This is hybrid, the algorithms are hybrid, the solution is hybrid, and really you should think about a quantum computer as an accelerator that's in the cloud, right? Among many other types of compute. And when we think about what we wanna solve with that, think about using both types of compute uh, in concert with each other, or many types of compute in concert uh, with each other. So when we think about redefining computing, I think you know Dave just talked about Feynman and what we wanna do with a quantum computer. You know, the most exciting application uh, is really the simulation of physical systems, right? Being able to simulate and model systems that otherwise are very, very hard to model efficiently or accurately on large classical systems, say even the top supercomputers. So here, if we can better model physical systems, that gives us an opportunity to solve problems like catalysis problems. How can we better take and capture, say, carbon dioxide, uh, perform carbon fixation, and convert carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, for example, to methanol? Um, and that could help combat, say, global warming, right? Uh, how can we better uh, find a catalyst to help produce artificial fertilizer? In turn, that could really help our ability to, um, to more efficiently produce fertilizer and then obviously um, help with say, uh, you know, agriculture and crop production. Uh, and similarly, if we can model uh, different properties of materials, say, can we take a material and study exotic properties? Uh, th these problems are all very hard 
on classical computing with classical computing and we need something else. So with exotic properties and materials, for example, we could then understand, is there a, is there a material that can superconduct at higher temperature? And this would be an unlock for clean energy uh, solutions, for example, and for sustainability. So these are all really compelling reasons we want to build a quantum computer and have a scaled up quantum system uh, so that we can go after these types of problems. Now, with all these problems, one big caveat, one big thing to remember with quantum computers is you really should look at small data problems and large compute problems. Uh, at this point, we don't know a great way to read in lots of data into a quantum computer. Uh, so these problems, though, what's nice about chemistry and materials is it's really a small data space, but a large compute space. And this is where quantum computers can really excel. Now, with that, um, I want to go into detail on one of these catalysis problems. So one of the most exciting areas is computational catalysis. This is an area where we have, we currently have, um, you know, barriers in our classical compute. We can't get to the energy or to the accuracies we need. Uh, we can't get to the, uh, we can't easily study heavy metals, for example, and so forth in, in, uh, in such catalysts. So in carbon fixation, right, we want to design a chemical process that improves the reaction, right, in enables us to take carbon dioxide, find a catalyst that enables that conversion um, and, and enables it, say, to convert to methanol and, and do this efficiently, right? So ideally, that catalyst can be reused. It finds another carbon dioxide, you know, reacts and, and so forth, right? So that we don't have to have lots of catalyst uh, molecules in the mix. But so we want this efficient, you know, conservative, if you will, process. Uh, and we want to be able to do this industrially. So Currently, you know, studying this on a, on classical computers, on supercomputers, this is this is very inefficient. And it turns out, right, if you look at high performance computers, um, there's many cases where we can simulate chemical processes efficiently using HPC, using supercomputers. But when you have quantum correlations and you need to understand those correlations and those reaction rates well, this can prevent. In, uh, prevent you from being able to understand those accurate predictions, right? Make accurate predictions before you go build something in the lab, right? Ideally, we make it all computational, we automate the process, we can predict, right? And we, we build it in the lab last. Um, so this is what we want to be able to unlock. And for certain problems, for example, in the case of carbon fixation, studying these catalysts in high performance compute environments is, is too computationally intense. Uh, so we need a quantum computer, right? A quantum computer can now enable us to study these quantum correlations computationally. Uh, so that would be a huge step forward. Now, the catch is that we need a large quantum computer to do this, right? It needs to be a full scale. It needs to be fault tolerant. Dave just spoke about error correction. We need fault tolerance here uh, to unlock this type of solution coming from quantum acceleration. Uh, but what's exciting is it does does promise to be able to do that, and it promises us to be able to accurately predict properties of catalysts, carbon fixation just being one example, but a very compelling one. Uh, so in the last several years, uh, over the last decade really, um, my team and colleagues around the world uh, have been working together to advance these algorithms. So you know, one, one note, we heard about the Moore's Law, say for superconducting qubits earlier today. Um, but time and time again, algorithmic speedups can outpace Moore's law. So don't 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 just rely on the hardware improving. I also want to encourage you improve your algorithms. So here's a good example of that. Uh, if we can improve our algorithms, we can really bring down the cost and the need for that hardware to scale up. So over the last 10 years. Um, we've been able to achieve a 10 order of magnitude reduction in the quantum algorithms runtime for solving computational catalysis types problems. This makes this a very compelling example now, a very compelling uh, case, uh, a use case for quantum acceleration for quantum computers. And we did this by using software tools, a mix of software tools and theory, mathematical tools together, right, to create these advances, studying the bounds of the algorithm, studying the behaviors in simulation, programming the algorithm, using tools, for example, that we offer, uh, for example, in Azure Quantum, uh, we've been able to bring that down. And so I think it's a really exciting time to be studying quantum quantum computing, both from the software side and the hardware side, because they're actually coming together, right? We bring down the cost of the algorithm, we improve the hardware, and that gap is closing uh, to where we can start to see uh, examples running on quantum computers. So in this case, we've been able to bring the algorithms down from what was a runtime of, say, a billion years, even on a quantum computer. This is considered efficient by computer scientists, uh, polynomial time. Uh, but you have to remember the degree of the polynomial. We've been able to br bring that degree down, and now it's roughly a month run time 
on a quantum computer, assuming certain, uh, certain architecture here. Uh, so that's pretty exciting, right? But now we still need a fault tolerant quantum computer. Um, and we also need tools to program and test these algorithms in advance, understand how they work on the quantum computer. And so here, Azure Quantum is an example of a full stack cloud ecosystem where now in the cloud, right, you have access to quantum hardware. You can try small examples of quantum programs running on quantum hardware. Um, exciting to, uh, we're excited at Microsoft to have IonQ as a partner in this. So you can run quantum programs on the IonQ hardware Dave, uh, Dave just spoke about. Um, also on Honeywell hardware and QCI hardware. Those are um, another ion trap system and another superconducting qubit system. Uh, and you can write one piece of code, say in Q-sharp, you can use the quantum development kit, the tools around that to simulate the algorithm, resource estimate it, understand it, optimize it, pass it through the compilation stack, and then execute against uh, quantum hardware. So it's a really exciting time also as a, a developer or an engineer to be able to test these ideas in practice. Now, to get there, though, I just want to, uh, you know, as I start to close out, I just want to mention we do need that fault tolerant system. We need to scale up systems to be pretty darn large to run this type of carbon fixation uh, computation uh, on a quantum computer. So I want to point out here, if you look here at this graph, this is the error rate uh, in the system versus the number of qubits. And roughly, this is a you know, back of the envelope style plot, don't take this uh, fully exact here, but in the bottom right is roughly the size of our systems and the error rates we have today. To run an application, say we need 100 logical qubits, and that's going to require many, many physical qubits, and these blue lines here show that, right? Uh, we're going to need upwards of a, you know, roughly a million physical qubits to run something like this catalysis type of solution. Uh, so we still have a long ways to go to close that gap, and I want to just encourage all of us to lean in either on the software or the hardware side and really bring this together. Uh, but we still have a ways to go. We're at roughly, you know, 100 qubits or less. Uh, today, we need to get to a million. Uh, we're at error rates are roughly 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3 today. We need to get to something that's more like 10 to the minus 12. And we can do that through error correction. So it's really going to take a village to bring this all together. Um, so it's exciting to have uh, things like you know, the large investments like the National Quantum Initiative that brings people together from different communities, different backgrounds, computer science, physics, engineering, chemistry, right, uh, cryogenics, uh, material science. We need everyone coming together to really advance uh, towards scaled quantum computing and towards seeing uh, quantum, quantum acceleration have an advantage. Uh, I really like to close just with this quote from Bill Gates, uh, you know, at the same time, we want to close this gap, uh, but we often, you know, we always, as he says, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. So don't let yourself be lulled into inaction. So I think there's a lot of hope for what we're going to see from quantum computing over the next 10 years. And uh, I'm just, just so excited uh, to see the progress we're going to make together. So with that, I will close. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Krista. So I think uh, there are already two questions. Uh, maybe we can take it that in the full panel. Is there any specific questions from Krista's talk? Um, so I, I have one question. So I, I mean, so your uh, you show this algorithmic speed up, right? Um, that you have from like this like one billion years to one month. Uh, how hardware agnostic that is? Yeah, yeah. So that's being cost out. Um, in that case, those those, it's fairly hardware agnostic. Um, in that we've taken into account, you know, a rough runtime. We can plug in other runtimes. Um, the exact runtime, I think it's, you know, we set a certain logical clock rate. So if the logical clock rate is a little slower, it will take much longer. <laughs> uh, and if it's faster, it'll it'll be faster. But you know, that that clock rate is a reasonable clock rate, say for superconducting qubit systems or the type of systems we're looking at with topological qubits. Okay, thank you. So Andy also has a question. So are the recent algorithm improvements you referenced predominantly coming from mathematical advances in writing codes or from better compilation of existing algorithms? Well, it's a bit of a, um, it, yeah, it, it's a bit of a mix, right? So um, what I, 
what I should point out is we, we program the algorithm, for example. And once you program the algorithm, you can look at the sequence of operations and you can start to take into account how you can better optimize that sequence to both compress the number of operations, so reduce the number of operations by, say, changing orderings and so forth. Um, but then additionally, you can also look at parallelism there and um, and also see uh, the, other, the other piece here is with fault tolerance, we also have to look at how you produce those fault tolerant operations and you can also change like the types of operations you're doing and that can also help reduce the cost overall. Um, so a bunch of these are compiler style, uh, you, you might call them compiler style optimizations. And then, um, and then additionally, we also looked at the bounds of the algorithm, tried out different, um, uh, you might call them, uh, you know, different functions or different routines, different subroutines within the algorithm. There's a lot of different advances in, in the quantum algorithm community where you can do use different approach, approaches within the algorithm, different subroutines um, uh, to, to achieve the same solution. So we've also played with those. So those you might consider more mathematical um, options. Uh, so both of those come together to, to enable the advances. It's not just one single change to the algorithm that was made here. It's actually a sequence of many. There's probably 10 to 15 different different tricks you might say that were applied here uh, to, to achieve that reduction. Okay. Uh, there's another question uh, specifically to Krista. The, what about cost of quantum versus ordinary computing? Are hmm. there proofs of the existing or non-existence of fast algorithms? Well, we have, um, yes, I mean, we have, so, so here's, when you look at the history of quantum computing, I mean, there's a couple of things to call out, right? Often we've seen that, okay, you can have, um, you know, over the best known classical algorithm, you might have a quadratic speed up or a super quadratic speed up or an exponential speed up, right? Or something, something along these lines. So we have proofs of speed ups over the best known or the existing classical algorithms, right? Um, then in addition, when you look at those algorithms and you look at those proofs, like often those are pro proven in terms of um, uh, bounds, right, or in terms of complexity theory, right? Uh, and so when you go to implement the algorithm, it's also important to take into account, you know, you actually have to implement those underlying functions. It's not just the query calls or the oracle calls anymore. Uh, those are just, you know, you often cost an algorithm uh, first from the theory perspective in terms of black box costs, right? We, we would call it an oracle cost, but we don't necessarily look at the cost of that oracle. So when we implement the algorithm, that's where things like Q-sharp and the quantum development kit and being able to program those algorithms is so important. You then go in and you actually write down, how do I compute this function on a quantum computer? What are the costs, right? And sometimes you you uh, you learn that that oracle function is actually quite expensive. Even if you only called it once, if it's really expensive and it, and it really uh, takes over the cost of the whole algorithm, right? Then, then it may not be an efficient algorithm anymore. So there are, are really uh, careful, we have to be very careful to actually cost the full algorithm out in terms of how it would be implemented and look at all those costs inside those Oracle functions, for example, um, to know if you really still achieve a quantum advantage and a quantum speed up in practice, right? When we would consider in implementation on hardware. Hopefully yeah, that addresses I'm yeah. Uh, thank you, Krista. So I think we're going to go to like the, all the questions to all the panelists. Uh, so this question from Josh Meath, I think it was asked during David, uh, David's talk, but essentially is the computational complexity of a warm molecule is less than that of a cold molecule. Uh, so David, maybe, I mean, you can- I mean, I can take a stab at it. Uh, it you know, there there are less algorithms known for, so so the, the question is like, does a really noisy quantum system, is it easier to simulate? And there are places where we know if it's, if there's a ton of noise, the answer is definitely yes. Um, and th this, this, this is probably one of the least understood trade-offs about, about sort of systems that are going on. So to give you a concrete example of this, uh, while I was at Google, they performed this uh, beyond classical computing experiment where they ran a random circuit that was very large and it was, was hard to simulate. And this is a noisy circuit, right? Uh, and one of the real, you know, one of the interesting things that happened in that is that, that, that one of the things they did is they went through this process of like competing against the best algorithms in the world. So if you were going to simulate this quantum computation on a supercomputer versus what you did in the lab, who's going to win? Right? And so you learn a lot about the different algorithms that you're, you're trying to throw from the classical world to like simulate that quantum system. 
And a lot of the approaches that people came up to sort of attack that were based on the fact that the, the Google system has you know, a particular geometry or uses a particular gate set. But the one place where there wasn't really an attack that worked particularly well was if the no system's noisy. And I, I think this is actually a very fascinating question that we don't understand exactly what's going on there. Uh, we certainly know that in this, if it's really noisy, then it is easy to simulate. So if it's very warm, noisy equals warm, then yes, we think that, that there might be easier ways to simulate it. Um, Krista probably has a better perspective on this because she's she's uh, been working on this problem for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, in terms of, yeah, you know, there's different, uh, we look at simulating, in terms of simulating noise, uh, we definitely look at lots of different ways to simulate the noise in the quantum system. Uh, that This is very challenging. Um, all up, you know, you, there's different classes of operations where you can simulate efficiently on classical computers. And then in other cases, uh, right, then when there's something quantum, obviously it's it's costly. <laughs> That's the whole point of building a quantum computer. Um, so I'm not sure what else we want to add. Uh, what further to add here <laughs> at this point? So there's another question. Um, where does US quantum computing stand with respect to China and Russia? <laughs> Man, so, so that's a super complex question and I'm not even gonna to attempt to do a ranking. I, I, I know very little about Russia, but China is widely known to be a powerhouse in the field of quantum technologies. And I suspect that is part of the motivation for our country being so forcefully behind quantum information in the last few years. It, it, it's hard to think of a time when we've had such a big push in the US. I mean, it's almost like that moonshot. We had the JFA quote about going to the moon. This is like our version of that moonshot. There's a ton of funding in the US to, behind this. And I think it is to keep pace with what other, you know, the, you know, the European Union is involved in this too, of course. Yeah, so I just add like, we, we don't know what's happening. We only know what's published. Right, the people on this panel, but um, you know, China or groups in China have published some very high profile papers and communication, and that definitely spurred people because this was something that our country could understand. When they publish, we can we can send a secure key between a satellite and a ground station. Um, that was something that that perked up to people that don't have training in quantum information, and and that changed the landscape a lot. But if you look at the technology in that demonstration, much of it was developed, not in China. So, so we still have like, you know, we just didn't, by we, the United States is not part of me, but uh, didn't put together all the pieces and weren't striving to do that particular demonstration at the time. Uh, so there are two questions from Vishwes. Let's take the first one. How do you envision the classical computer using the quantum accelerator distributing itself across the temperature gradient from room temperature to 15 millikelvin? That is, will it suffice for the classical computer to operate at the room temperature or are there known applications that require lower latency interaction and that's computing at like lower temperature like 4 kelvin or 77 kelvin? Maybe I can take a stab at this one uh, real quick. Uh, so, you know, I think there's a, it's important to think about the different types of classical compute that are in the system. Uh, so first, um, the, the quantum computer is hybrid, right? In terms of the algorithm itself we want to run, the solution we, or program we want to run, there will be both classical and quantum instructions in that program, right? So first, there's those types of compute uh, instructions, right? So that are part of the algorithm. Then there's the classical compute required to actually run the quantum computer. Right? How do we actually tell the quantum computer to run its quantum instructions? We also need classical compute to control the system and read out the system. Um, additionally, we talked about error correction today uh, throughout the panel. Uh, error correction requires a decoding algorithm, and that decoding algorithm is a classical algorithm. Right? So we're also running a classical algorithm that's looking at the quantum computer, getting signal the readout signal coming, right? You're getting readout signal, you're taking in that signal and you're making a pass to understand what's the best, you know, think of it like a prescription, right? For, for an ailment you might have, what's the best prescription I can give you right now 
to help to help you feel better, right? To help the quantum computer overcome its noise. Uh, so, so we're constantly running that as well in a fault tolerant system. So, so you have many types of classical compute, and these classical compute systems um, can sit at different temperatures, right? And not all quantum not all quantum systems will be at really cold temperatures, right? That's something to call out as well, right? The ion trap system is very different than, for example, the topological qubit system we're working on. So our system does sit at the millikelvin temperature range in terms of that quantum plane where the qubits sit. And so then you have to get control signals through that temperature gradient, right? All of that temperature change. And there's a lot of consideration in terms of thermal budget, in terms of noise, right? Decoherence, how will it impact your qubits? You can't heat up that system. Um, so indeed, some of that compute you want to run in the cold, in particular, right? When you're controlling and reading out those qubits, you need some of that compute very near the qubits or close in temperature to the qubits. But some of the compute at the algorithm level, maybe even the decoding level, can sit outside the outside of that cold environment and sit closer to room temperature where you're, you know, where we all live. Um, so, so you know, you're going to tease that apart and look at in terms of thermal budget and noise. What's the best? architecture for all that classical compute. Um, it's exciting. It, uh, just last year, we announced a cryo CMOS system for control of qubits. Uh, so this cryo CMOS system actually runs CMOS at, you know, uh, at cold temperatures, right, you know, and it's it's divided from the qubit plane, we run a CMOS control chip, we basically take a room of electronics, put it on a chip, put it next to the qubits, and then we can control that qubit system. And that helps minimize also the amount, you know, the number of wires you're having to run into that fridge. So if you're having to run, you know, hundreds of wires into the fridge, right, it could heat it up, it also takes space. So with this new system that we, um, that we uh, published uh, several months ago, now, uh, we show that with just three wires running into the fridge, you can you can achieve this cryo CMOS control, and that can control tens of thousands of qubits. Um, so there's lots of con considerations in that classical compute environment, and then the thermal thermal uh, architecture of that. Okay. Yeah, I think that that's yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll take the next question to um, how do you see industry and academic labs cooperating or competing in the quantum computing area? So, so one of the things that, that, that the U.S. has done to get forcefully behind these technologies is set up, like, there must be like a dozen new quantum centers, uh, some funded through the Department of Energy, some through the NSF, and they are openly, explicitly encouraging partnerships between national labs, universities, and private industry. And, and th th those have all been set up now, and it, it appears to me to be a great model. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, can you speak more on the different expectations for quantum error correction algorithms for logical qubits and for successful quantum, quantum control schemes for your hardware? So it's sent to Dave, but I think other can also chime in. So maybe David, you can take it first. Yeah, I mean, so error correction's a fascinating subject. And uh, I think it's, it's um, you know the the thing that I think we what we don't what one of the things is is that we 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 spend a lot of time thinking about different codes that we could possibly use and different what people call the threshold. So the rate at which if you're below the threshold and it's not just a single number. Crystal, will yell at me if I say it's a single number, but there's some set of numbers. If your if your system's below this and you're there's this good region, then error correction sort of works as you scale the system up. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of work to be done in the near term to think about as we build this out and think about different logical qubits than the ones being considered. There's a code, the surface code, which dominates a lot of discussion because it has a very good threshold and works really well. Uh, and uh, I love the surface code. It's a beautiful, beautiful code. But I, I think especially in these places where we have weird architectures, it's not at all obvious what the right uh, code is going to be. And it's not just for ions where they have this interconnect. There are other places where you might think about reducing number of wires, like which Krista mentioned, right? Like, you know, if you look at the pictures of Google's quantum computer, you'll see this amazing spaghetti monster of like wires coming down, right? And literally, you know, that's one of the main challenges for that system is, you know, that just the amount of wiring getting into the system is gigantic. But imagine you had, you know, a less number controlling more qubits at the same time or something like that. So how, how do we play these trade-offs? So I think it's a fascinating discussion about like how how that architecture will will move forward. And as always, I suspect that our current ideas will be looked at in the past as sort of like, oh, what were they thinking? <laughs> and that's why I'm I'm excited because because these new things are are coming, right? Okay, thanks. 
So it's another question is the, the quantum phase is an almost analog quantity. Um, so is there a reason why we do not have many analog classical computer now? And I think this kind of, we're getting at the analog computers are more efficient than digital computers for some problems. Um, I am guessing the question is for analog classical computer, but maybe we can also add like, why not there is the less analog quantum simulator? My understanding is most of them are digital quantum simulator. Um, so can anyone, David and Krista, I think you guys are <laughs> the company for building quantum well, we, simulator. We can talk about, I mean, the, you're probably, I mean, if you're, you know, the simulation story is also very fascinating, right? We have these systems we can build with large numbers of qubits that can simulate other same materials. And, you know, the real question there is, are you doing exactly what you think you're doing? Right, which is a challenging question, but you, you can imagine that actually a lot of these will be like some of the most fascinating, useful things in the short term. If I can use a simulator to simulate something related to high temperature superconductivity, that's an amazing system to sort of be able to control and build and perhaps get learning about what's going on without having this more digital model uh, of quantum computing. So that's one place where there's like a very positive. Uh, you know, the reason these analog computers, you know, the quantum computers aren't analog and they, we don't see them all around is, you know, these systems interact with their environment and they quickly lose their, their even their analog nature, right? They really become kind of boring, uh, probabilistic systems at some point. Uh, and, and that's sort of this, this, co this problem that like when you interact with a quantum system, it entangles with an environment and loses its quantum, quantum behavior. And so it loses that, even that phase thing very quickly. Okay. Yeah. I think this question probably Bren for you. Um, I know you Chicago works closely with Argon and Fermilab, which were like fairly close. Uh, is it possible that PNL is going to create a large quantum unit in uh, Puget Sound Energy or maybe a new national lab that focus on <laughs> quantum would be created here? Well, you know, we, we have affiliations there. There is a there's an organization called the Northwest Quantum Nexus that involves Microsoft and the universities in the Northwest. We are also uh, it, you know, the, the lab is very large. We are, we collectively at the lab are members of, of depending on which person, up to three different of these national quantum centers, uh, including the one uh, uh, centered at Argonne. And so in, in a sense, we were already involved with those. And at, at this time, I don't have, we, there are no plans for anything new beyond those. I mean, these new quantum centers are the new big thing. I mean, but those are the partnerships. Yeah. Um, so, Krista, the CryoSimus controller, is it developed by Microsoft? Yes, um, yes, we have, so we have uh, labs around the world working on different parts, so different components in the system, and that uh, controller was developed by David Riley and uh, our team at, uh, in Sydney, Australia. Um, so he's located at the University of Sydney, but um, we have a, a team of Microsoft employees there working uh, and you can look up the paper on the archive. If you look up David Riley, uh, you'll find it. <laughs> I think it's, you know, one of the recent ones on his list there. Yeah. So there's another comment, but I think we can ask this in a question that from information theory, I mean, there has to be some bit error rate and when it exceeds 0 0.5, it doesn't really work very well. Do we have like a number for quantum that we can say? David and Krista. I think Krista should give a number just so I can hear her number. <laughs> and then we can talk about how, whether it's right or wrong. <laughs> so what was the, is the number for the, I'm, is it the, th are you saying threshold number or the it's probability of? I, I think it's a special number. I mean, this sort of question, it's a comment, I think, but I think we can consider as a, what is the threshold for beta array for quantum? Oh, well, it varies. It varies. <laughs> In the early days, it was horrible. Let's just put it that way. In the early days, the first codes, uh, and actually th there's a very interesting story. There are, there are classical places where say you want to compute in one dimension. So you only have one spatial dimension and you want to compute classically, right? Like I want to robustly store in classical information and compute. And it seems actually impossible because in one dimension, you only, you don't have any way to sort of know whether I'm in a sea of zeros or a sea of ones. Uh, and it's actually possible to do this. And the threshold for that one is, I think it was estimated. It's something like it's some ridiculous number, ten to the minus forty or something like that, right? So, so we're better than that one. Uh, but people will give you numbers that vary. They'll say, uh, you know, a half a percent, or they'll say it just depends on the context that you're studying it too. And that's actually why it's kind of fascinating because we sort of know that it's in some ways context dependent. So it may depend on 
on what 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 we actually do in the in the real world when when it actually comes down. And the, there's some beautiful papers actually about that sort of problem. Like we really need to build these things to understand what's going on to see what the right code is to use. So. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with Dave. You know, I I did a lot of papers in my earlier career on thresholds, <laughs> and you know I say it varies because depending which paper of mine you read or paper in the community you read now, right? There's been a lot more papers on this now. Um, you'll see different numbers all over the place, and and that's because the assumptions are different. And so I I really I I think of myself as becoming more and more applied, right? I want to see a quantum computer built. And so we need to think about a threshold, right? This this case where we actually are looking at the architecture it's it's run, it's considering, we're looking at the code we're actually going to run, we're we're considering all of the environmental, you know, the environment impacts um, because that that matters, right? In practice, we can have a beautiful uh, theoretical threshold number. Um, but then in practice, we may be orders of magnitude away from that. And to re really build a machine and scale up, we need to understand what that number is going to be. So it's an exciting time to move from that theory where we have this beautiful theory that lays the foundation and says, hey, it's possible. We can error correct. Yes. OK. And that error correction, you know, that threshold in theory isn't isn't so scary like 10 to the minus 40. <laughs> um, right. You know, you see half percent, one, et cetera. Right. So. Um, uh, so you know, ten to the minus two, ten to the minus three. In there, you can you can you can actually error correct that machine, but you're going to need a lot of qubits. So I think it's a it's an exciting time to really dig into the you know the guts of that system and understand what the threshold will be for these different architectures Thanks. and codes um, paired together. There's another question. So does operating at higher frequency involve trade-offs between operating temperature and coherence times? And if yes, like kind of what are the trade-offs and how it's going to be handled? Yeah, so like in the superconducting qubits, you know, that that transition frequency is already kind of large compared to the thermal temperature. So so that part is already solved. But but what can happen is uh, if you try to create or you try to treat that qubit like like it's really just a two level system, you can fool yourself because, you know, there really are those other levels. And where it comes in is in things like in the control pulses you use to do like your pi pulses and so on. You know, you're putting in a wave at some frequency, but you're turning it on and off very suddenly. And if you think about Fourier transforms, there are a lot of other frequencies in that. Those frequencies can actually drive you into that like two or three state, which are not useful qubit states that you want. And so you, you do have to watch out for those limits. It's kind of built in the design and it's built into the way they're operated. And, and, and there are some limits associated with them. I just want to add that, you know, this, what, what, when people say, oh, we have to work really, really, really low temperatures, otherwise we're going to have this thermal problem. This is not true of all physical systems. That's right. So the other thing is you have to have a coupling to your environment. If that coupling to your environment is not there, you can work at warmer temperatures. And so it may be strange, but the NV center, for example, that I was talking about earlier, its frequency is, is three gigahertz but it has a coherence time of one millisecond at room temperature. Mm -hmm. It can't operate at a computer at room temperature because it turns out to access that spin, uh, we have to go low temperature through the, the optical transitions, but, but it can, but it, it doesn't interact very strongly with the environment. And so you don't necessarily have to go to higher frequencies. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, everyone. So I think we had a lot of very good questions. So I, this, um, maybe we are going to stop the Q&A right now, and then we are going to do close, closing by Eric. OK, great. Um, thank you. That was um, super uh, informative and interesting. Um, uh, thank you to all of our panelists for um, all of the um, insights that you have and for sharing your work. We really appreciate your um, being involved in this event. And thank you to all the attendees um, uh, for coming and listening and, and asking good questions. So um, as you can see, you know, quantum is totally happening in the Northwest. And, and actually the question to Kaime is, you know, how are, uh, that she answered, we're, we're poised to become um, definitely a world leader in this area. And, and we're really, really quite close. So um, I should mention also that, uh, that, that our department, electrical and computer engineering has two open faculty positions. Uh, we're looking for uh, people at the assistant professor level in quantum information science and technology. Uh, and this is part of a university-wide strategy. Uh, and for our department, it's it's part of a long-term hiring strategy. So these will be the first of, of hopefully many um, hires that we make in this area. Um, and, and ECE really wants to um, 
uh, fill in that gap in the stack that goes all the way from the physics uh, to the to the algorithms and compilers. Um, I want to thank Arca and uh, for and Kaime for uh, and and uh, Mariam for organizing uh, this event. And I also really want to thank the Lytle family and Louis Scharf and all the donors who contributed to making today's events possible. Um, and I want to take uh, thank Jesse and the and Emily and the advancement team and the PR team for for organizing everything. And don't forget that today at 3:30 Pacific time. Um, so if you're in a different time zone, that you have to add an hour or subtract. Um, uh, we'll have the the actual Lytle lecture, and that'll be Scott Aronson. He's the professor. Uh, he's a professor um, at uh, UT Austin and the director of their Quantum Information Center, and a really really interesting and entertaining person. Um, so it'll be a really fantastic talk. So please um, uh, attend that, and I hope to see you there. So thank you very much again, and um, uh, enjoy the rest of your your day and think about quantum computing. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the panel. That was fun. Hi, everyone. <laughs> thank you for. Thank you. For thank you. Thank you. This is great.